Welcome to today's webinar brought to you by Orisher Technologies. Orisher Technologies is a global leader in oral fluid substance abuse testing products. Their unique assays provide accurate and easy to administer testing methods to help determine the presence or absence of drugs or alcohol in a person's system. Oral fluid based testing products provide a simplified collection process, faster results, cost savings with minimal risk of tampering, and dramatically reduced risk of adulteration. The Intercept Oral Fluid Test is an FDA-cleared laboratory-based oral fluid drug testing system that enables accurate testing for drugs of abuse including marijuana, cocaine, PCP, amphetamines, and opiates. With a fast and easy-to-administer collection process, Intercept is ideal for workplace, criminal justice, drug treatment centers, the clinical setting screening program, among others. Today's presentation is approved for one credit hour of continuing education from SAPAC for CSAPA. Further information will be provided at the end of our presentation. Today's presentation is entitled, How Drug Free Is Your Workplace If You're Not Random Testing? and will be presented by Bill Current and Pamela Mack. Bill Current is the president and founder of WFC and Associates, a national consulting firm that specializes in drug testing policy development and providing accurate and up-to-date state drug testing law information. He is the editor of the online ultimate guide to state drug testing laws at statedrugtestinglaws.com and the publisher of the e-newsletter State Drug Testing Laws Monthly and the weekly e-news service Drug Testing in the News. Pamela Mack has served on the Board of Directors for the Portland Human Resource Management Association for over seven years and is currently President-Elect. She is an owner of the employment screening company OcuScreen. OcuScreen is a full-service employment screening provider helping employers make informed hiring decisions by providing background checks, verifications, and drug testing services. It will now be our pleasure to hear from Bill Current and Pamela Mack. Well, thank you, Jessica, and it is a pleasure to be on a uh, part of the monthly Orisher webinar series and to be on another Orisher webinar today on the subject of random drug testing. We're going to talk about a number of things related to random testing, and uh, for some of you who perhaps have been on a random testing webinar in the past, uh, you're going to notice some new things that we've added that we've expanded uh, into this uh, slide presentation today, so we hope it's it's valuable for everybody who's joined the webinar today. I've always found it interesting, however, that even though most companies that do drug testing conduct pre-employment screening, and yet we know from government reports that there is a significant percentage of people in the workforce who are current substance abusers. And so if we're conducting pre-employment testing, and yet we still have a significant percentage, up to 15, 16, 17 percent, of the workforce with the drug problem, then it tells us that in many cases uh, these individuals are sort of gaming the system, if you will. They're getting past that pre-employment screen, they're coming onto the payroll, but they're bringing with them their substance abuse activities, um, and that's costing companies. We're going to talk about how that, how that is um, manifested both in dollars and in other ways as well. Random testing presents an opportunity to sort of take a real chunk out of that, that cost and control the level of drug abuse and the costs associated with it. So in today's webinar, we're going to kind of set the table again, as we often do, with the, some statistics about the magnitude of the drug problem and its particular impact on the workplace. And then we'll get into random testing basics, where Pamela will come in on that section and talk a little bit about the basics of random testing and having a random testing in a workplace setting. We'll talk about random testing and state drug testing laws, We'll also talk, because this is a big issue nowadays, we'll talk about random testing and legal marijuana, excuse me, legal marijuana laws, which there are a number of states that have such laws, and we'll get into that. Then we'll talk about the effects of, uh, of, of detecting marijuana with lab-based oral fluid testing specifically. We won't be talking about instant or POCT oral fluid testing, except to make a little bit of a comparison in the cutoff levels between lab-based and POCT oral fluid testing. And then we'll talk about return on investment. So by the time we finish, you'll sort of have a very clear picture of the magnitude of the problem, the effect that random testing can have on the drug problem in the workplace, and then some of the things you need to take into consideration in terms of state laws, marijuana detection, and what you can expect in terms of ROI from random testing. 
so as we launch into the magnitude of the problem, most of the statistics I'm about to share, and I'm not going to go through all the verbiage that's on the slide right here, but most of it comes from the federal government. They put out a report every year, the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, which comes out from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, SAMHSA, as most of us know it. And these studies, are, these surveys have been in effect since the mid-1970s. I mean, this is data that goes back a long way. So if you want to really look at drug use trends, go to that SAMHSA website and look at the National, drug use, uh, National Survey on Drug Use and Health, and you can go back years with that and see the trend. And they, and they break it down by ages, by gender, by employment status, uh, by regions of the country, by p specific drugs. It's really the best information that's out there of this nature. And so in 2012, which was the 2013 report, there were nearly 24 million Americans over the age of 12 who admitted to being current illicit drug users. That's somebody who admits to using illicit drugs at least one time in the 30 days just prior to being surveyed. So that's 9.2% 9, 9 of the population 12 and older. In that same survey, marijuana was, of course, as you might guess, the most commonly used illicit drug, nearly 19 million current marijuana users. Now, current being the last 30 days prior to being surveyed. You can also, in the survey data, look at past year use. And so these percentages dr jump up and the total numbers jump up dramatically when you go beyond just the 30 days prior to being surveyed. And then also, the survey includes information on lifetime use. In other words, individuals who will admit to using illicit drugs at least once in their lifetime, once in the last year, or once in the last 30 days. So these are the lowest possible numbers that we get from the, from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health. But they're pretty alarming. When you look at the marijuana statistics in particular, that's, that's really the sort of the core of the drug problem in our country. And, and this really ties directly into this whole movement to legalize marijuana. And this is not a, a webinar today on marijuana, but I'll just point out that in the last 10 years, and I did a webinar on this last month where I updated all my statistics on, on marijuana usage. In the last 10 years, the rate of THC-related traffic fatalities has tripled. Well, that just happens to correspond with the legalization of marijuana in a number of states for medical purposes. And then, of course, we don't really have data on it yet, but Colorado and Washington legalized it by, by vote of the voters in November of 2012. And so we're just now 2013, but really into 2014 and over the next few years, we're going to start to see the impact in places like Colorado and Washington where marijuana has been legalized for recreational use, not just for medical use, but for recreational use. And so we've got a lot of people who are already smoking marijuana, who are current marijuana users, and that rate is just going to increase significantly as more and more states legalize marijuana. But again, today's uh, webinar is not specifically about marijuana. I do want to point out, however, that, the, that if you look at that second bullet, nearly 9 million people 12 and older admitted to being current users of illicit drugs other than marijuana in 2012, and the majority of those were people who admit to abusing psychotherapeutic drugs. We're talking about tranquilizers, stimulants, sedatives, pain relievers. These are the oxys and the hydro drugs, et cetera, oxycodone and hydrocodone and, and you know, the, ex the expanded opiate panels that many companies are now testing for. Again, I, we're not going to do a, a, a presentation on that, but it's important to note that marijuana is a problem, but so is prescription drug abuse or the abuse of psychotherapeutics. Um, for many years, as most of you probably know, cocaine was always the number two category of drug abuse in our country. And over the last several years, the abuse of all of these psychotherapeutic drugs combined as a category has catapulted into second place with a fairly healthy lead over cocaine and hallucinogens and inhalants and heroin. Um, and that's a significant problem because as we talk about having real drug-free workplaces, the question we have to ask is, are we even testing for the right drugs? We know marijuana is a problem. We have laughed at testing for PCP for all these years because it's required under the DOT regulations, and the, the positivity rate for PCP is always minuscule. But are we testing for these other drugs? Cocaine, yes, of course. Uh, opiates, yes. Amphetamines, yes. But what about these other drugs that are in the, the class of psychotherapeutics? 
that's where a lot of drug abuse trends can be found in that class of drugs. And so we have to ask ourselves, are we testing for the right drugs? As far as drug abuse among people who are employed and unemployed, yes, the rate of current illicit drug use among unemployed is higher than it is among those who have jobs. 18.1% of unemployed Americans admit to being current illicit drug users, and then you can compare it to the other numbers below that. But that's still significant, right? I have heard a number of companies over the last few years, because of economic conditions being the way they are, considering discontinuing their pre-employment testing program. I think that's a big mistake for a lot of reasons. Even though some people gain the system and get past it, which we're going to talk about in detail today, there are still a lot of people out there who are current illicit drug users who are unemployed and looking for a job. And so it would really be perhaps uh, counterproductive to discontinue pre-employment testing, even though there's tremendous value in implementing a random testing program. If you go to that second bullet on the page, the percentage of adults employed full-time who were current illicit drug users increased from 2011 to 2012. Again, an indication that people are getting past the pre-employment screen and are coming onto the payroll with you know, a history of using drugs. And, 20, and of the 21.5 million current illicit drug users, 18 and older, Remember, 23.9 total current illicit drug users, but of that, 21.5% were adults. 14.6 million were employed either full or part-time, 60, almost 68%. That's significant. That is a, that's a large number. Okay? So it sort of, you know, sort of blows away this, this idea, this misconception that drug users are all unemployed or none of them can find jobs. A lot of them have jobs. 68% of current illicit drug using adults who are current illicit drug users of that are, are um, on the workforce. And so we're not going to spend a lot of time in the second category, the impact of drug abuse on the workplace. I think, you know, you've seen these statistics before. You've seen these categories. You, when you conduct supervisor training in a, in a workplace, you're, you're training them not only on the specifics of a company's policy, which is very, very important, but you're also talking about the specifics of the signs and symptoms of substance abuse. And so you're, you're training them to look for some of these things as it relates to perform, job performance and productivity. Of course, you know, the typical supervisor or manager is not in a position to really be asked to make a diagnosis of somebody being a drug user, but they can be looking for the common signs and symptoms of substance abuse, and perhaps that may identify somebody who is having other problems in their lives that may be indications of having a drug problem, from marital issues to financial issues, et cetera. Well, a lot of this just sort of drills down to the bottom line. You know, what's this really costing? We know that substance abusers have a higher rate of accidents in the workplace, that they're less productive, they're not as reliable in terms of showing up for work. They file more workers' compensation claims than other employees compared to their non-using co-workers, and they tend to work for smaller companies more than larger companies. Now, there are many more smaller companies than there are larger companies. This is from a, a survey also from SAMHSA from several years ago. 37% of substance abusing workers with small companies worked for three or more employers in the past year, so they tend to move around a lot. They either, as you look at that last bullet, they either get fired, they may get laid off, or in many cases, nearly 30%, they voluntarily leave one company to go to work for another company. And, and it, the moving around is much more prevalent among smaller companies, but even among larger companies with 500-plus employees, 28% of substance abusing workers work for three or more employers in the past year, and 65% work for two employers in the past year. So that instability in their employment is also costing you, the employer, money because it costs you money to replace people. There's no way around it. And it costs money to employ drug users. These statistics come from a study by the U.S. Navy. Now, this Navy study is interesting. If you can find it out there, it's worth reading. It came out probably in the late 1970s. It wasn't really about the cost of drug abuse in the workplace. It was about identifying the optimum random testing frequency rate. And we're going to talk about what a random frequency rate is in a minute. But the Navy did this very detailed study of how to identify the optimum rate for random testing. And in the process, 
they also identified the cost of each drug abusing employee on your on your payroll. Now, in the case of the Navy, they were only looking at lost productivity and replacement costs. So, you know, this turnover statistics that we just looked at would factor into that. They concluded that the rate was somewhere around seven thousand. It was just under seven thousand dollars. So I rounded it up to seven thousand because one, it was you know twenty years ago, and two, um, it's probably much higher than than that now. But let's just stay at seven thousand. That's going to come into our ROI discussion at the end of today's presentation. And so they looked at the overall monetary cost of employing just one drug abuser. There are a number of studies out there that show, or I might say, claim because there's really no definitive study out there on this subject, that drug abuse is costing the workforce, the employer community, anywhere from 60 to $200 billion annually just in the United States. But I really think what's more pertinent is looking at that per user number, that $7,000 number. I think that's what resonates with employers when they're sort of teetering back and forth between drug testing or not drug testing or just doing pre-employment testing or maybe spending a little extra to do random testing, I think the $7,000 a year per drug user is a number that resonates with the small business owner in particular. And we know that the rate of drug testing among small companies is much lower than it is among larger companies and certainly among Fortune 500 companies. So it's sometimes the small business owner that really needs to know this kind of information. And that leads us to the whole discussion about random drug testing, the basics of random testing, whether you want to do random testing, and, and eventually from this section we're going to talk about the return on investment that an employer can expect from random drug testing. But now Pamela is going to kind of take us through a discussion of random testing basics. So I'll turn the microphone over to her at this point. Hi, Bill. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so, random ba testing basics. We're going to move on to this next slide. Thank you. Um, first of all, it's important to remember that random testing needs to be a suspicionless form of testing. Um, I'm often asked if we can manipulate the selection so that some people don't get called in twice in a row or maybe add someone on that has um, they've heard rumors about or something like that. There is suspicion testing available, but um, that's a whole different thing. Random testing should be random without any manipulation and should be done by some sort of a random selection process. And um, we would recommend using something like a random selection software, or better yet, have your TPA, your third-party administrator for your drug screening, use their random selection software. That keeps you out of the process entirely, and that way um, you're simply going to provide the names of all of your employees that are in the pool to your TPA. They're going to run it through a selection process, send you back the people that are going to have their random test, keep you out of the loop entirely. Um, you wouldn't want to give advance notice to your people, obviously, and that includes not scheduling your random tests the same day every month, which is some of the things I hear out there, because it won't take your employees long to figure out when the advance notice is. If they're going to do it every first Monday of the month, um, you can set up a random pool by a job class, but everyone in that job class will need to be in the pool. So if you have, say, a safety-sensitive um, workers, you might do random testing on all your safety-sensitive workers and not your office workers. That's fine, but everyone who's in that class needs to be in that pool, and you can't take people out because maybe they were called last month or the last time you tested and don't want to be called again. That's just important for to keep your liabilities down by being very consistent in that. Um, you will need to identify a frequency rate. Um, it's If you're DOT, these things are very regulated for you, but for non-DOT, you have the option of testing how you basically how you want to in most states. Um, you can say, for example, you're going to do 50% of your population over the course of a year, or you're going to do 10% each time you do a random, 25% each time you do a random, and you can pull those randoms weekly, monthly, quarterly, semi-annually, however you want to. So you might want to do, we want a 10% pull every month, and that way you're going to um, test 10% of the people in your pool every month or every quarter or however you want. We recommend that you also use a random selection to Oops, I just lost my slides. That's not good. <laughs> we recommend that you also run a random selection in order to um, pull the dates that you're going to do it because what you don't want is, like I said, is to do it all the time and um, do it all at the same time and have everybody 
uh, know when it's going to happen. So what we do with our clients is we randomly pull the dates for them within that time period of quarterly or whatever they choose so that when, once it comes, we just request the information from them and we go ahead and pull the random for them. Um, so on the next slide, we're going to move to the next slide, I believe. Um, there is going to be some information on DOT testing. There we go. Um, this is just an example for you of what kind of random rates a DOT requires. And they'll do something like 50% of the population over the year, but tested quarterly. So you're going to manage that over the course of a year so that by the end of the year, even though you've only tested quarterly, you've tested half of the pool. Um, they're also going to do a 10% alcohol test. Some non-DOT um, organizations do alcohol testing with their randoms, and some don't. It can create some ADA issues. Um, so it's, it's up to the employer if they want to do that or not. And then on the next slide, we are going to just talk about um, where are you going to start and what are you going to start thinking about to include in your policy. You're going to have to include random testing in your written policy. I'm going to have Bill speak a little bit more on that after this slide because uh, he is the industry expert. Um, but just so that you'll know what kind of information that you do need on your written policy, um, you're going to want to make sure that your supervisors understand um, what this policy is all about, what their part in it is, and um, how to handle letting their employees know it's going to be a random, whether they're going to be, the supervisors will need to know if they're going to be trained for, to run an oral, to do an oral fluid test on site, if they're going to be escorting employees to a clinic, if they're going to be giving them a time limit. So you're going to need to make sure your supervisors know what their part of the, the um, process is your employees are going to need to probably sign off on a new policy if that hasn't been part of your policy so far. They're going to have to know how the testing is going to be handled, how much time they will have to get it done. Um, some people send, especially if they're doing it on site, they just call them in and do it immediately. Some people give them a certain amount of hours to go off and get it done. Um, so the, empl the employees are going to have to need to know that kind of information. And then also what happens if they're to refuse. Then you will need to decide what type of testing you're going to be doing. You're going to need to decide how the employees are going to be selected. Is your TPA going to do it? Are you going to have a software program? How will your dates be selected? Who will administrate and handle your on-site testing? And then what to do when the results come in. When you get a positive result, you're going to need to know how you're going to handle that. It could be a case-by-case -case basis, but you're going to need to know whether it's going to be leading up to termination, whether it's going to be a last chance agreement, what you're going to have in place for, for the specific situation. And then the testing method itself. Is it going to be a point of collection test, a POCT, which is a instant test, or is it going to be a lab-based test? If it's an instant test, um, you're going to have to do some kind of confirmation testing on the positives. So if it's an instant urine, you might send them off to a lab um, for their confirmation test. If it's an instant um, oral fluid test, you might be doing a lab-based oral fluid test afterward to confirm it. Um, and then you're going to have to decide, are the positives going to go through medical review? Are they going directly to medical review? Are they coming to me first and then going to medical review? Typically, best practice is to send it directly on. But those are all the things you're going to need to decide. And then lastly, results reporting. Some states will have um, requirements on whether that needs to go through an MRO before you get results or not. And um, Bill will talk a little bit more about state requirements as well. So. Everything that Pamela's just taken us through are the basics, and you may notice that some of this could be applicable to, say, reasonable suspicion testing or post-accident testing, and of course that's true. The point is that you want to make sure you don't miss any of these steps when it comes to random testing. You're just asking for trouble if you're not somehow confirming random drug tests, or like, like Pamela was mentioning with POCT or instant testing, if you have a presumptive positive or a non-negative on the front end, you want to make sure that you're confirming that result in the laboratory, especially with random testing. Remember, as, as Pamela pointed out, random testing is it's suspicionless testing. It's, it's based on the random selection of the individual to be tested. And so you want to make sure you cross all the T's, dot all the I's, that everything in your program is in compliance with the state laws that apply to you, which we're going to talk about here in a second and that you're doing everything the right way because random testing is going to be a little bit more 
susceptible to challenge. And so if you can show that you have all of these basic things in your program, it's in your policy, you don't make exceptions, this is the way we do it all the time, the better for you. And so what, what you're looking at on the screen right now is just some generic language that could be in a policy relative to random testing. It wouldn't be the entire random testing section of your policy, but it might be a, you know, sort of a way to get your random testing section started. So I'm pausing on this for a little while in case you want to take some notes on this, but let me read it to you and we'll go through it. So all employees will be subject to random testing. It could just be safety sensitive workers that are subject to random testing. You may be in a state like Minnesota, for example, where random testing is limited to or restricted to safety sensitive workers only. Or you may be in a state like Connecticut where it is also restricted to safety sensitive workers, but that where the state actually puts out a list of occupations that can be subject to random testing. But you may be in another place like here in Florida where I live, where all employees can be subject. So all employees will be subject to random, unannounced drug and alcohol testing. Now in a DOT program, yes, you're gonna most likely, if you're under Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration regulations, for example, you're gonna do random alcohol testing. But I wanna point out that the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, the EEOC, has ruled long ago that random alcohol testing in a non-DOT or in a non-government mandated program would be, in their estimation, a violation of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And there have been some legal challenges to employers conducting random alcohol testing. So I put it here to, to remind myself, to remind you and to make that point with you, that in a non-DOT, a non-government government mandated testing situation, it wouldn't always necessarily just be DOT, but in a non-mandated situation, you probably don't want to do random alcohol testing. And we can provide more information on that uh, if you'd like to email me in and I can provide some of that information to you. Employees subject to random testing will have an equal probability of being neutrally selected for such testing. In other words, everybody who's in the pool is always in the pool and they can be randomly selected to be drug tested. The company does not have the right to waive the selection of any employee who has been randomly chosen. Random tests will be unannounced and performed at reasonable intervals throughout the year. As Pamela mentioned, you could be doing 50% of your workforce at, on a quarterly basis. And like she said, it's random. So you're not doing it on the first Monday of the second week of every quarter or anything like that. It's truly random. The select and, and, and to secure or to ensure that your random testing is truly random, the selection of employees for random drug and alcohol testing will be made by a scientifically valid method such as a random number table or a computer random based random number generator that is matched with some type of an employee identification number, a, a social security number, et cetera. This is often a service that a third party administrator like OcuScreen will provide for their, for their clients so that the client's not actually running the random program, but they're using a third party to do that. And that really just creates another buffer between the employer and any type of you know, accusation that the employer is gaming the system. Uh, and as Pamela mentioned, sometimes you have companies come to you, and if you're an employer, you may have thought this yourself, where you know, we want to random select, we want to random test this guy over here because um, you know, he's always messing up. So I'd like for him to be random tested today. And of course, that's not random testing. That's a random testing violation right there. That's more like reasonable suspicion, and then all the documentation comes into place, and you have to have you know more than one. You should have more than one supervisor making that determination, etc. Random testing needs to be truly random, and in many cases, you're going to run into state drug testing laws that will spell it out for you in black and white. This is what random drug testing is, and if you want to do it in this state, here's how you have to conduct your program. Not every state permits random drug testing. There are a few that restrict it. A couple of states, Rhode Island and Vermont, that actually prohibit it. Unfortunately for employers, none of these state laws are exactly the same. So random testing, as I mentioned under the Minnesota law, is restricted to safety-sensitive workers. But as I said in Connecticut, it's also restricted to safety-sensitive workers, but they actually put out a list of those occupations. So even though you may have two states that limit random testing to safety-sensitive workers, they may treat it very, very differently from one state 
to the next. Or you may be in a state like Florida or Texas, you know, two states that are very conservative in terms of, of their uh, support of drug-free workplace programs. They're very pro-drug testing types of states where there are no limitations on random drug testing. In fact, here in Florida, we have a workers' comp premium discount law that allows companies that qualify to be in the program to receive a 5% discount in their workers' compensation premiums, but they have to drug test according to the guidelines that are provided by the state. Interestingly, here in Florida, as part of that workers' comp discount program, random testing is not required, but it is specifically permitted by company choice. So there aren't restrictions or regulations on random testing, but you can do it even in the workers' comp premium discount program. And outside of the workers' comp premium discount program, there are no restrictions really other than common sense and maybe taking a DOT type of program and using it as a blueprint for your random testing program in Florida or in Texas or another state that doesn't have a random drug testing law. But you have to keep in mind that some states, as I said, have voluntary laws like here in Florida, and other states have mandatory laws like the examples I, I gave you with Connecticut and um, Minnesota. Montana has a, a mandatory law with a very unique provision in it. I'm not sure that I know any other state that has this provision when it comes to random testing. A procedure that requires the employer to obtain a signed statement from each employee that confirms that the employee has received a written description of the random selection process and that requires the employer to maintain that statement in the employee's personnel file. So random testing is allowed in Montana of safety-sensitive workers, I'll, I'll add, but you have to get a signed statement from each employee that you've educated them on the random selection process that your company uses. That's unique to Montana. I'm going to take you through a few examples of different states' treatment of random testing in these five categories. So who can be subject to it if it's specific to safety-sensitive workers, if there's a frequency rate mandated, and then if confirmation is required and MRO verification is required. Keep in mind that even though a state may not specifically say that you have to do these things for random testing, if it's in the state law, then you can assume with certainty it does apply to random testing, even though it doesn't break it out that way. It's talking sort of as a, as a covering over all types of drug testing, whether it's random, post-accident, reasonable suspicion, and perhaps even pre-employment testing. Sometimes there are exceptions for different things when it comes to pre-employment testing. So in Minnesota... Can all workers be subject to random testing? No. It is restricted to safety-sensitive workers, and it specifically allows random testing of safety-sensitive workers. That's important. However, there is no frequency rate mandated in the Minnesota law. Confirmation testing of positives is required generally, so you can assume that it applies to random testing also, although the Minnesota law does not, excuse me, the Minnesota law does not specifically mention MRO verification as a requirement for random testing, it's a logical uh, thing to do and obviously a smart decision in terms of your, of your drug testing program in general. In Connecticut, as I mentioned, no, all workers may not be subject to random testing. It can be, excuse me, safety sensitive workers can be subject to random testing, but as I mentioned, the state actually puts out a, a list of approved, what they call high risk, or safety-sensitive occupations that an employer can perhaps subject to random testing. There is no frequency rate mandated in the law. Confirmation testing is required. And MRO verification, again, interestingly enough, not mentioned. But in Wyoming, a little bit different situation. All work Now, this is a voluntary state law, somewhat like Florida. All workers can be subject to random testing if you're in that program. It is not limited to safety-sensitive workers only. There is a frequency rate mandated in the law. Confirmation testing is required and MRO verification is required. What's interesting here is that they don't actually include those procedures in the Wyoming law. They defer to the federal regulations to 49, 49 CFR Part 40. So if you're familiar with the SAMHSA guidelines, you're going to know what those are. But if you're not, you need to review them and make sure you're following them for your random testing program in Wyoming. A few other things, interesting things in the notes for Wyoming. Again, as I said, some states go into detail about random testing procedures, while other states don't. In Wyoming, it specifically 
um, explains that random testing will only be administered just before, during, or just after employee work time. Sounds a little bit like somewhat like the DOT regulations, right? Again, they're, they're borrowing heavily from the federal regulations. Employees must remain in the random selection pool at all times, regardless of whether or not they have been previously selected for testing. We explained that earlier. That's generally just the wise practice. <clears throat> employees shall be selected for testing by using a computer-based random number generator. Very specific there on how random selections can take place. And, of course, no advance warning will be given to employees regarding the dates and times of random testing. That's just, that's just very smart business right there. But in Wyoming, it's part of the law. It's required. And so, again, this is just a sampling of what you run into out there if you're a multi-state employer in particular when it comes to random drug testing and state drug testing laws. You have to know the laws that apply to you. I get asked this question a lot. Which law applies to me? I'm here in Texas, but I've got operations in 27 states. And the answer, of course, is they all apply to your company. If you're doing business in, you have business operations, you have employees who work and live in a certain state, the, the law of that state applies to those workers. It does in, in other areas of the law as well, but certainly it does when it comes to drug testing. Okay. So that's just, again, a little sampling of state laws. We don't have time to go through all of them, but I would highly encourage you to review the state laws that apply to you. Make sure if you're doing random testing, you're in compliance with those laws. Now, there's a lot of confusion when it comes to legal marijuana laws and what employers can and cannot do when it comes to drug testing, and even more specifically, random drug testing. So let me state very unequivocally you can still do drug testing, even in states that have legal marijuana laws. You, you, you know, there are two types of marijuana laws. There are the med medical marijuana laws, and there's the recreational marijuana laws, like Colorado and Washington have. In all of those states, you can conduct drug testing in the workplace. Again, this is not a, dis the, not a presentation on marijuana in the workplace, but just know that you can also conduct random drug testing for marijuana. So in your panel of drugs that you use to do drug testing in your workplace, just because you're in a state that has one or more of the legal marijuana laws does not mean that you have to remove marijuana from that panel and only test for cocaine, opiates, amphetamines, and PCP, or the expanded opiate panels, or whatever you're testing for. You can still test for marijuana in all 50 states in the country. In fact, some of these uh, legal marijuana laws have specific language in those laws that protect employers' rights to insist that their employees not be at work under the influence of marijuana. And the Illinois uh, medical marijuana law has specific drug testing language in it that specifically states employers still have the right to test for marijuana. So when it comes to random testing, yes, you can still test for marijuana. There is no restriction on testing for marijuana. The same is true regardless of the method that you're testing with, whether it's lab-based oral fluid or instant urine testing or traditional lab-based urine testing, hair testing. You can still test for marijuana regardless of the type of drug testing that you're doing. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about the ability to detect marijuana in a lab-based oral fluid testing program. Let me clarify just two points real quickly as I launch into this. One, I'm talking about lab-based oral fluid testing. There's a big difference scientifically in the technology of lab-based oral fluid testing and POCT, or instant rapid result oral fluid testing. And it's not to say that there's something wrong with instant oral fluid testing. If you've ever been on any one of my webinars, you know I'm a, I'm a proponent of all drug testing as long as it's done right and as long as you understand what you're getting and what you're not getting with each different type of drug testing method or the circumstances, like what are you really getting with random versus post-accident and reasonable suspicion. It's also important to understand what you're getting with lab-based oral fluid testing versus POCT oral fluid testing or POCT urine versus lab-based urine. These are all important things to understand. Marijuana can be detected in lab-based oral fluid tests. That's the short answer, and that's the good news, okay? But there's more to it than that. There are a number of factors that come into play. For one, marijuana is 
detectable like other substances through an oral fluid sample within an hour of use of the drug, if not immediately. I'm going to show you a chart I've got coming up in a few slides that's going to illustrate that, and we'll talk about that more in more detail in a second. But the cutoff levels are very, very important when it comes to being able to claim that you can detect marijuana with this t testing system versus that testing system. That's a big factor. I'll, I've got a chart on that, too. The testing method, lab-based versus POCT, the science of the, of the two testing methods, very, very different. So that, that's a factor. And, of course, we know now that SAMHSA is in the process of developing regulations. It's a slow process, albeit, but it's a process that's in place right now to develop regulations for lab-based oral fluid testing. And this is a huge, huge development in the world of drug testing because for many, many years now, the SAMHSA regulations have been restricted to lab-based urine testing. And so this idea that they will eventually, in the near future, include lab-based oral fluid testing is huge. And I think we could probably expect to see hair testing in, down the road also, not as soon as lab-based oral fluid testing. I think the government's still a little bit hesitant when it comes to instant testing devices, whether it's oral fluid or urine. But, you know, POCT urine testing may be down the road too uh, in terms of what the government's willing to allow. But we do know that lab-based oral fluid testing regulations are in the works, okay? So that's important. And the window of detection, the, there are a number of differences, as I said, between the two technologies, lab-based and POCT oral fluid. Again, you just need to know what you're getting and what you're not getting. So when it comes to cutoff levels, it's important to know that the majority of cutoff levels, for, or excuse me, positives for THC, 80%, are below the 50 nanogram level in an oral fluid drug test. And so that vertical red dotted line that you see sort of to, slightly to the left of center is the 50 nanogram mark. And so those blue bars are the percentage of the rates of positives, not the percentage of the rates of positives, and you lump them all together and you see that 80% of those positives are below 50 nanograms. And the majority of those are below right around 20 or below. Uh, so the cutoff level makes a huge difference when it comes to being able to detect oral fluid, or excuse me, detect THC in an oral fluid sample, okay? And this is the other chart I was, I was mentioning earlier, which is the window of detection. This is important. You need to understand the window of detection because blood and oral fluid are shorter windows of detection than urine, and hair is even longer than blood, oral fluid, and urine. But oral fluid mimics blood in terms of the window of detection. So THC is detectable in an oral fluid sample perhaps almost immediately after somebody's ingested the drug. So you see that blue line there comes almost all the way to the vertical black line at the left of the chart, indicating that, it's, that THC is detectable, and other drugs as well for that matter, in an oral fluid sample almost immediately after the person's used the drugs, just like it would be with blood. With urine, there's going to be a little bit of a gap there. There's going to be a little lag time between ingestion of the drug and when it can be detected in a urine sample an hour, maybe a little bit more, but that window of detection with urine is going to go out into a, you know, a little bit farther in terms of uh, the open window of detection. Well, so you're going to get some positives on the back end of that window of detection with urine that you may miss with oral fluid, but if you're concerned about recent use, you're concerned about people being under the influence after a lunch break or after a, uh, some other type of time when they're out of the workforce, then you're going to miss some of those with urine testing. And so the positivity rate between urine and oral fluid testing when it comes to THC, very, very similar. In fact, a number of studies have showed that lab-based oral fluid testing has a slightly higher positivity rate than lab-based urine testing. That's important to know. Again, what you're getting, what you're not getting. But THC is detectable in oral fluid. You're going to have a shorter window of detection overall, <clears throat> but you're going to have a window of detection that opens up almost immediately after drug use. And that's important, again, if reasonable suspicion or post-accident testing, or if, you're, if, if those are the things that you're looking at, or if you're in one of these states where somebody's, uh, one of the states with a with legal marijuana law, and somebody tests positive on 
Monday or Tuesday, you know, and they claim, or Wednesday or Thursday, but they claim that they use marijuana on the weekend. And besides, it's legal. If you're testing them with oral fluid and they test positive on Thursday, that's not the marijuana they used on Friday night, the week before, or Saturday, <clears throat> because the window of detection is shorter. You know that they used marijuana probably in the last 24 hours, if not even shorter window of detection time period. Very powerful argument to make for oral fluid testing, particularly lab-based oral fluid testing in Colorado, and Washington, and the 20 states that have medical marijuana laws. And the bad news, of course, if you're watching these things, is that the, the pro-marijuana people are very, very well organized and very well funded, pouring millions upon millions of dollars into getting state legislators to introduce legislation to legalize marijuana. And we're probably... I hate to make such a, a, a sour prediction, but I think we're probably going to see maybe three to four states legalize marijuana in 2014. The, the pro-marijuana people are predicting uh, Alaska, Arizona, uh, California, and Oregon, possibly the District of Columbia as well. I don't know if they're going to get all five of those states in the district, but, but they're working on it, and so it's something to really keep an eye on. Now... Here's the, the really fun part of today's presentation, and that's how to, va how to measure the value of random drug testing. And there's lots of different ways that you can look at this. I'm going to break it down into three different categories. And as I do so, there's some numbers that I'm going to assume right from the very beginning. But first, let me just point out that there are many employers out there. If you're a drug testing provider, you probably have clients that aren't doing random testing and part of it is because they may not understand the value of random testing. There was a study done a couple of years ago by the, the Society of Human Resource Management and DASHA, the Drug and Alcohol Testing Industry Association, in which 16% of employers said they don't do random testing because they don't see any return on investment in it or they consider it too costly. That's information that needs to be corrected in their minds because nothing could be further from the truth. Let me walk you through this process. So, and I'm going to go kind of quickly so we can leave some time for Q&A at the end. Let's assume we have a company with 1,000 employees and 15% of the workforce has a substance abuse issue, which is the national figure, 15%. And each substance abusing employee is costing his or her company $7,000 a year. Remember, that's the figure from the Navy study. So let's do the math. 15% of 1,000 workers is 150 workers. And 150 workers times $7,000 is $1.05 million annually. That's a lot of money. And some of these people are kind of skirting past the pre-employment test and bringing their drug use habits with them into the workforce. So let's assume that we're using a 20% frequency rate for random testing at this particular company, and we're paying $55 a drug test, and 5% of our random tests are positive. Now that 55% may be way higher than you're paying, and 5% randoms may be higher or lower than what you would expect. But that 5% comes from a study from one major laboratory. 20% of 1,000 workers, right, we're doing 20% frequency rate. So we're going to end up doing 200 random tests. 5% of those 200 are going to be positive. So that means that 10 workers tested positive and were able to either terminate their employment or get them the help they need so that they're no longer costing us $7,000 per year each or $70,000 total. So we've spent $11,000 on drug tests, right? We did 200 tests at $55 a test. We spent 11,000 on our random drug testing. We identified seven workers, saved $70,000. We have a savings ratio of one to 20, oh, excuse me, one to seven, a dollar, $7 saved for every dollar we spent on random testing. But that's just a drop in the bucket when it comes to that 1.05 million that our drug abusers are costing this company. So I think we can do better. Let's look at another study, this one from the U.S. Navy, <clears throat> which has been conducting random testing since the 1980s. They did a survey back in the late 80s of enlisted personnel, and 83% said drug testing was the number one to turn to drug use, and that 27% said they would resume using drugs if the Navy discontinued its random testing program. 27%, that's, that's a big number. So 
we're going to redo our math now, and we're going to add in that 27%. Okay, so the top information stays the same. And in the math section, we're still doing 20%. We're still got a 5% positivity rate, so we've got those 10 workers already. But 27% of our 200 drug users in this particular company, or of the random test that we did, that's 54 additional workers who aren't using drugs because they don't want to get caught in the company's random testing program. So now we have a total of 64 workers at $7,000 each per, uh, during the year for a total of $448,000. We've only spent $11,000 still, but through positives and the deterrent factor, we've identified $448,000 in savings, a 1 to 40 ratio. And so now I hope you're feeling pretty good about random drug testing, but I think we can do better. Remember, I referred to a study some years ago by the government <clears throat> of drug users who are employed. 40% indicated in that study that they would not work for a company. They wouldn't even come to work for a company that does random drug testing. And 30% said they wouldn't work for a company that does pre-employment testing. But let's now factor that 40% in. In other words, 40% of our drug users didn't even come to work for us when they found out we did random testing. So we still have the 10 who tested positive, we have the 54 who are deterred from using drugs, and now we've got 80 others who wouldn't even come to work for my company because I'm doing random testing. I've got a total of 144 now at $7,000 a year. That is now a savings of a $1,000,008. I've almost got my $1.05 million total. I've still just spent $11,000, but I've saved over a $1 million, a 1 to 91 savings ratio. So when it comes to identifying the value, the return on investment of random, of random testing, you really have to look at the whole picture. $70,000 was probably worth it to begin with, right? Because I only spent 11000 to get there. But we're actually deterring people from using drugs, and we're actually discouraging others from even coming to work for us in the first place. Our savings is significant once we see the overall big picture of random drug testing. So now we've gotten to the end of the presentation. We've got some, some questions that have been submitted. And Pamela, you're on the line, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I am. Okay. So as we go through the Q&A, Pamela, some of these questions are probably going to be for you, but feel free to jump in at any point, okay? All right. So here's a question. I'll throw it out to the two of us. Why not do oral and urine-based pre-employment physicals to get the benefit of both windows of detection, the short term, the long term. Do you have any clients that are actually mixing the technology? Some are doing, say, oral fluid for post-accident reasonable suspicion, but maybe they're doing urine testing for um, uh, pre-employment, pre let's say. Yeah, actually I have a lot doing that um, for two reasons. One, because pre-employment, they they can send them off to the clinic. They don't really care how long it takes them. <laughs> they just want to get it done on their own time. And so they'll send them off and do that. Plus, they will get that longer detection window, and they want, especially for marijuana, they want to know that. And then when it comes to their random or their post-accident, they really want to know now, first they want it to be fast and easy. They want the person to be done in 15 minutes without ever leaving the building. And they also want to, to know what they're doing there on the job. They're not concerned usually at that point so much with what they're doing on the weekend as they are. Are they bringing this into the company? Are they currently using? Are they, con you know, consistent users? So I have quite a few clients that, are, that split them up and do both. So they like to get the wider window of detection with urine for a pre-employment test perhaps, right. but, the sh they, but they like the shorter window for post-accident reasonable suspicion or maybe even random testing. That, that sounds like they're getting the best of both worlds. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> have another question that you might want to handle. Wouldn't you want to leave yourself some room for the frequency rate? It says, why select 10% if you maybe on occasion want to do more than that? Are you restricting yourself or limiting yourself if you put 10% in your policy? And be, being you're the policy person, <laughs> I'm going to let you answer that one. Well, and I, you know, and here's a, and it kind of relates to another question that's here in the board as well. Somebody asking about whether or not you even want to put your random testing frequency rate in the policy. And I've had employers do both. Now, of course, we write drug testing policies here for a living. So we do what the employer wants us to do. We advise them on the state laws. There are some state laws, however, that require the employer to explain what their frequency rate is in the policy. 
It's kind of similar to companies that don't want to put the cutoff levels that they're testing at in their policy. There are a number of states that actually require that you put the cutoff levels as well as putting in the frequency rate. You're not necessarily limiting yourself to just 10% if that's what you put in your policy, but you do want to alter your policy before you increase it from 10% to something else. And again, this goes it's a smart business decision anyways in terms of protecting yourself and being able to be transparent and show the consistency in your program. But also there are states that require any changes to the policy to, they, excuse me, they require the employer to notify employees of any changes that they make to their policy. And so you might be in a state with a, with a 10% notice requirement, excuse me, a 10-day notice requirement, 30 days, 60 days. Not unusual to find 30 or 60 days advance notice required before you can change something like that in your policy. But there are some states that require that it be in the policy. And so whatever it is, that's what you need to be doing. You don't, in other words, you don't want to put in 20% if in reality you're only doing 10%. You want to be able to come back and use your policy as a way to defend the integrity of your program. Okay. Um, a couple of other questions have been submitted. Um, let's see. Um, well, one was oh, uh, whether ahead. or not, I'm sorry, Bill, to interrupt you. One was whether or not an employer can test whenever they want an employee that has tested positive previously, say, in a random test. And I think that's a different situation than random. You can't manipulate the random test in any manner or you'll lose your randomness and um, won't be considered a random test anymore. However, if you do have an employee on a last chance agreement, um, you, you can then make an agreement with them that you're going to test them a certain amount of times or however often you want to. It depends on the agreement. Um, so that would be a separate situation than a random test. They might still be in the random pool, but you can't make sure they keep coming up. But you can have a separate agreement with them and giving them a last chance agreement. Okay, perfect. Um, somebody just made a comment. It's not really a question, but I'll just share the comment, which is <clears throat> um, with random testing deterring, you know, a certain percentage of people, as I mentioned in the ROI example, from even wanting to work for a company that does random testing, it was 40%. Uh, do you want to advertise that because couldn't you possibly be losing some good workers? And, of course, if they're a drug user, if they're deterred from use, from working with a company that does random testing, in many cases they're probably drug users. They may, they may object on other grounds. But in this particular survey that I mentioned, it was a survey of current drug users. So we know in that case it was 40% of current drug users. And so sometimes employers, and Pamela, you may get this question often from, from clients or potential clients that are wondering whether they should do drug testing and whether or not drug testing is going to end up costing them, you know, good employees who don't want to work for a company that does random testing. How do you usually address that issue? Um, I don't hear that so much from employers as much as I hear they'd rather advertise it and just weed out those people that don't want to like you said, I think that in the most cases, it might be some people that just don't believe in drug testing, and that's fine. But for most employers, they're more concerned about not having drug test drug users working for them, so they are fine with announcing that they don't do drug testing, just so that they don't have to spend time interviewing and waste money drug testing someone who's um, going to fail anyway. So I think they, in the cases that I have, most of them prefer to let people know they do drug testing and just weed out anyone who um, is going to try to get through. Okay. Yeah, I don't hear that concern as, as much uh, these days as I used to, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, but it does come up occasionally, so you do need to be prepared for that. question was submitted about um, legal marijuana in Colorado, um, <clears throat> making mention of a very significant legal challenge there where a paraplegic worker was fired uh, for using marijuana, even though he was a registered marijuana user, the courts upheld the uh, the employer's program and ruled against the worker, even though he was a legal user of marijuana in the state. He was a registered medical marijuana user. The latest on that is that it, it has been uh, kicked up to the Colorado Supreme Court. They have decided to to hear that case, to hear that appeal. So we don't know the end result of it yet. That's involving Dish Network, the, the, uh, uh, the uh, television cable kind of company. Um, I guess cable is a bad word if you're Dish or, or, or DirecTV, but um, the satellite uh, channel company. 
But I would imagine that if it is upheld uh, at the Supreme Court level in Colorado, it's going to stay that way for a long time. If it goes against DISH at the, at the uh, Colorado Supreme Court level, I would expect to see it challenged at the U.S. Supreme Court level, but we don't have that yet. Um, we're really out of time. We've got a bunch more questions here. I apologize to everybody. Uh, let me get one more question in. Uh, the adulteration possibility is almost just as much, if not more, with oral fluid testing than with urine. Has anybody done research? Actually, that's not an accurate statement. We've got a lot of information that shows that the adulteration possibilities with oral fluid are almost non-existent, and that's part of sort of the misinformation that is, tends to be out there when it comes to oral fluid testing. You have to just take into consideration the process that you go through to secure a collection of a urine sample and then juxtapose that to the process you go through in collecting an oral fluid sample. You don't have to secure the restroom. You don't have to put blue dye in the toilet water. You don't have to turn off the, turn off the hot water. You don't have to check people's pockets. You don't have to make them take off their jackets to leave their purses elsewhere. The oral fluid collection is 100% um, viewable the whole time between the donor and the uh, administrator of the test. And there are really no known additives that people can use to try to adulterate a saliva sample for a drug test. And so you're always right there in front of each other. There's really no opportunity for the donor to try to do something. And uh, I did a little research on this on a website that professes to help people pass their drug test when they shouldn't be passing it to, to successfully cheat on a drug test. And the best advice they had for cheating on an oral fluid test or getting away with it, let's say, with an oral fluid test was don't let them take your saliva. Don't let them have a sample of your saliva because if you do, you're going to test positive. And I think that's probably the best advice to somebody who's a drug user who's going to be subject to oral fluid testing. Once they have your saliva, you're probably going to test positive almost always, Sorry, especially with a, a lab-based test. Sorry, there's a comment about the mouthwash products, and I have done a little research on that just recently, too. And go in there and read um, about the mouthwash and what you have to do to use it. And it, it's, it's almost kind of funny because it has all these things about how much water you have to drink and how many times you have to urinate before you go into the test, all sorts of things like this that would absolutely have nothing to do with an oral fluids test. I haven't heard of them working, any of those mouthwashes yet. I'm sure someday someone will come up with something, but so far I haven't heard of that being effective. Yeah, but that's a very good question. I'm glad that one got submitted. Thanks for bringing that up. That is all the time we have. I'm going to turn it back over to Jessica to conclude and give you the closing information. And I want to thank Pamela for her great contribution and the opportunity to present with her today. Thank you. Thank you, Bill and Pamela. On behalf of Orisher Technologies, we hope you have found today's presentation informative and helpful. This presentation was recorded, and you will receive instructions informing you how to access the recording. Today's presentation is approved for one credit hour of continuing education from SAPAC for CSAPAs. Please email Jessica Polk at jessica at billcurrent.com. That's J-E-S-S-I-C-A at billcurrent, B-I-L-L-C-U-R-R-E-N-T dot com if you are interested in receiving that credit. Thank you for your attendance today. This concludes today's webinar.